Thank you. I, uh, I thought I'd start off with a, uh, a quote and uh, from my copious speaking notes. Um, you probably know this one, but uh, there are known knowns. These are the things we know we, that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. These are the things we don't know we don't know. And um, I've got to admit, years ago when I first heard that, I thought, what a load of bollocks, um, along with a lot of the world that commented on it, I think. But um, actually getting involved in the data space over the last few years, it actually started to make sense. So maybe I need some other help in a different way. But um, the critical thing for me in looking at this is that the unknown unknowns, data doesn't give you an instant answer, or rarely gives you an instant answer, particularly if you're looking at strategic issues. Data gives you insights, and hence my picture of a, a lighthouse. So I'm not a technocrat. I don't understand a lot of the magic that the guys in the data teams in the Department of Human Services do. What I do know is what it can show and what the opportunities are. So I feel like uh, I'm a bit like a car salesman here today, but I'm not trying to sell you a car. I'm, I'm trying to tell you that you probably own the car, just start bloody using it. Because a lot of the time, you don't look at what you've got. You don't look at who else has got things that you can access. You spend more time scaling across things instead of looking at what is already there. So that'll be a bit of the focus for me. Um, comment made about data is the new oil as a resource for the country, for the world, and about looking at the way in which you invest in your data and your information to start with is linked to the data you get out of it. The Productivity Commission makes comments about the value of the Commonwealth administrative data sets, and that's the value to everyone, not the value to one department in the Commonwealth, not to multiple departments in the Commonwealth, but it's as a national asset. And some of you sitting in the audience will say, yeah, that'd be great, but if only you'd give it to us. And I think one of the things that I want to stress is there is an issue about being curious and understanding what it is that you can do with data and being curious enough to come to the Commonwealth and ask us what we have in the data sets and understand what it might do to help you in your organisation, be it state level, local government level, other Commonwealth agencies, but to get to grips with not the high level stuff of how many people are on a, an unemployment benefit, but what are all the attributes, the layer after layer after layer that sit within the data sets that give you understanding about what is happening and from a social welfare perspective it's probably far more than most of you would realise. And so what we try and do in human services, we're not the owners of the data. The owners of the data are the Department of Social Services for welfare data, the Employment Department, the Health Department. But what we do in human services is bring it all together and we're an access point and following the protocols with our policy partners, we see as part of our role is how do we actually help people understand what is there and get the value, the true value out of data. Now, I'm hoping that this works. The guys have told me that it's supposed to work. This is now supposed to go automatically. And I'll just tell you a story about a 16-year-old uh, woman, or girl, depending on your definition, who lives at home with her parents. Her parents, one on Newstart, one on disability payment. As a result of that, we know when she was born because her parents got payments and have had parent, uh, payments over a course of time. At age 16, or turning 17, she has a baby. She drops out of school. She comes in to see us in her own right as a customer of our department and so we start seeing more about the person. We then understand that she's given us her educational status, her address, maybe whether she's got any earnings. We know the name of the child, the date of birth of the child. A year later she might move out of home, so she moves into private residential. She has a new address, updates income status, change of the payment depending on the, what other earnings she has, so it gets a little bit clearer about what we see and understand about the individual. A year later, she might move into private, uh, into uh, government housing. So there's an interaction with state housing. State housing come in and out of our data set to understand what earnings, what income she might have, so they know what rent to charge her. At the same time, she might get an electricity bill. So an electricity company, now that's not supposed to happen. I'm pressing stop. Um, so with the electricity bill, she gets to a point where the electricity company comes in, pings our system to find out if she's on welfare. Because if you're going to get a 10% discount to your electricity, thank you, um, she's going to be able to get the discount, but always with a test on our system. 
So there's a data interplay all the time. She then might get three months' worth of work. We know what her earnings are. She declares them to us most of the time. Obviously, there's always exceptions to how people tell us what's going on. Her partner may have returned and come back and live with her, so it changes the status. Her partner might then disappear, and we enter a child support stage of what are the payments linked to the child support, because the child support interacts with the family tax benefit. Her child turns five years old, there's an immunisation payment, and you've heard plenty of debate about that over the last few months. So there's a link into the immunisation system. The pharmacist checks whether she's on welfare to find out whether or not he should give discounted um, medicines. The doctor, if he's charging, um, going through and doing bulk billing, he gets a bonus if he bulk bills somebody on welfare, so they need to know the status of the person. Her youngest child turns six, she has to look for work. There's a requirement to engage with the job services. She might end up having depression and anxiety. She comes to us and gets an exemption, so we have a mental health link sitting in there. The partner comes back and stays with her. We change all of her rates, link it to being with a partner, but then there might be domestic violence. She can get an exemption for looking for work because of domestic violence. All the way through, all the steps, the welfare system knows and understands and records all this information. So the insights through housing, through welfare, through health, through payments, through employment, through a history of changing addresses, through interactions with the system, where the family stands, intergenerational welfare, is all held within a data set. One of the biggest data sets in the country. I think we're overall, the Department of Human Services, the combined data set sit in our uh, storage is bigger than the banks. But it's little used beyond the accuracy of making payments, which is our reason for being. Now we can move it on, thank you. So the same applies for a community in terms of shining a light, putting the lens on communities, of understanding not just how many people on a particular payment live in a community, you can all pick any community around the country, and it really can be any community. Even with one you don't think of as a uh, particularly disadvantage, people will get childcare rebates, they'll get family tax benefit, they'll get a range of different payments, even if it's not seen as being disadvantaged. Then you can pick a community that you know that you might consider to be disadvantaged. There might be 20,000 people in that location on a variety of different payments. We know about their address movements. We know about the changes to their status. We know about whether or not what the average earnings are while they're on welfare that have an impact on their payments. All of that creates an understanding about the nature of the community that live there. Because we never delete the data set around addresses, if the people move from those locations, and go elsewhere, we can actually do a longitudinal study and look at where those people have gone, what the change has been in the community. Needless to say, a lot of them have state housing. So when somebody moves, surprise, surprise, somebody else on welfare moves into the state housing. So if you just look at the isolated data set, it looks like nothing's changed, there's been no improvement. But if you stop and really understand what's in the data and look at it, and you look at perhaps people moving out and having a change in their life, but somebody else moving in, you look at the overall changes and the patterns that sit within the community, not just a raw set of numbers. And again, all of that for a community can be de-identified data, done at a reasonable data set, that lets you get an understanding about what's going on in a community and give insights. And all of this is that first shot of, it's the lighthouse. It's shining the light on things and giving you an understanding about what might be possible. One of the primary things is you've got to be curious. Data won't give you the instant answer, but you've got to stop and think about what might be and follow the data trail. Follow your curiosity and see what might happen. And bit by bit, some of the pictures become clearer, and sometimes the picture is what you knew in the first place. And that's not a problem. If the picture is clearer, but it's with evidence and with data, it can actually support you in a debate with central agencies, in a debate about resources and investment, it can lead you to other things through the evidence. So basically, we collect the data because we're involved in millions of phone calls, millions of interactions, and we hand out $160 billion a year worth of welfare payments. So all the time it's about, we collect the data, we don't delete the data. Our data holdings are immense, and the opportunity to explore the data, even de-identified, is probably the starting point that I'd leave with you. The value of administrative data sets is in the people that look after them, as well as the data. 
because you've got to know what it is that's in the data sets themselves. You've got to know how you govern it, and that's a really simplistic way of looking at how you look at managing your data. And for us, the key thing is where we use and where we look at release of information. We can use the data in a variety of ways. So outlier data, sitting there on the right-hand side, really easy, because you can look at the data and see something that is totally anomalous compared to everything else. So it attracts your attention, you can go in, you can dig, and you can work out what's going on. On the left-hand side, the fox in the middle, it's a far harder one. I use the example because of our compliance activities, be it a welfare recipient, a doctor, a specialist. Our job is easier on the right-hand side, far harder on the left-hand side, and you only get into there with truly understanding the attributes of your data sets. And again, that's back to the people that know and understand how to get in there. A quick example, so a cohort, 1.7 million people are in the totality of all of that. People receive centre pay, uh, or use centre pay to make payments, receive urgent payments, crisis payments, emergency payments and advances. You could add a whole lot of other things to understand what's a disadvantaged person or family. If somebody has debt, multiple debts, how long it takes them to pay it off, whether they're in the child support system, all could be other elements to this. But the only ones, 374 out of all that, get all five. Now, all you need to do is work on what's your definition of disadvantage to understand or try and target a slightly different cohort. Again, that's de-identified. What we can do is say of 374 people, here's the general description of the people that are in there. It's not about the individual, it's not giving their address or their name. It's understanding the nature of welfare in Australia and the interactions with the system and what it could mean, and particularly interaction between Commonwealth and state. And we're using some of this work now with several states. We collect unstructured data. We're getting better at that, we're not great. But understanding who's saying what, who's talking about what, how we can interact as an organisation immediately if something starts trending about a particular issue. We would say it's normally a policy issue that we're implementing as a service delivery agency. But funnily enough, sometimes it's our service delivery as well that becomes the topic point, i.e. queues and waiting lines and phone calls and things like that. But all the time it's a different way of getting data and information to look at what's going on. Longitudinal studies, we can reverse engineer, I shouldn't say we, they, the guys that know how to do all of this, not me, um, can reverse engineer a longitudinal data set and go backwards and then look at what's happening now. An example would be foster carers which we have a really large data set about foster care, which most states would find surprising, um, because when you fa pay family tax benefit, you've got to identify who the carer is. And if they're a foster carer, then they get the payment. So what we can do is pick out the data set, go and look at them 10 years ago, and then work out the likelihood of being on welfare 10 years later, having gone through the, um, the foster care system. 40% likelihood if you had one carer of being on welfare, 10 years later, 82% likelihood of being on welfare if you've had six carers during your time in the, uh, in the foster care system. No social worker would be surprised at all, but it gives evidence, it gives data to argue about, well, what might be done differently? And if you're curious, it might get you to ask other questions. Is it more meaningful if it was when you're a teenager versus a young person or whatever it might be? Did you ring your bell a little while ago, George? Good eye. The potential of data. Open data, sharing data, and integrating data. Probably the key thing that I wanted to raise, just as a, a bit of a messaging, is back to the issue of the potential is based on you and your thinking, about your curiosity, your willingness to ask the first question and go to the second question. The sharing of data that we do um, with a couple of different jurisdictions, with other agencies. Um, we've had the Black Dog Institute come to us looking at some information. We have protocols with the social services department about the release of data. If it's not a standard release or provision of information, we go back for a specific endorsement. But more and more, there's been an opening up about the data that is available and what we can actually use it for. And the we is the royal we. I would try not to dissemble too much between Commonwealth and state, Commonwealth and local government. It's a data set about most Australians in the country, whether it's on the Medicare side with health, or whether it's on the welfare side for about 7 million Australians. It's a record of 10, 15, 20 years. Every address, 
you could look at a cohort of people and see what their migration habits are across the country. If you start in rural Australia, we could backtrack and say over 10 years, if you started at 18 on welfare in rural Australia, how many addresses have you changed? Where have you moved to? Is it different, different if you're a male or a female? Is it different if you start when you're 18 versus 25? All the data sits in there through the addresses. So in looking at sharing data and open data, the opportunities are already there. A lot of it is the skillers in the asking of the question. No surprises there. We have helped some people to ask us the right question. Rather than, again, I'm sure there's at least one, maybe dozens in the room, who've tried to ask the question and got the, sorry, wrong question, and we'll sit down and not do anything further. What we try and do is work now of give us an idea of the question, we help frame it, and then we'll see if we can respond. On basic data, the open data sets are up on data.gov.au. They're the raw data sets of the welfare, and it's been great that DSS, the Social Services Department, have got their minister to approve these uh, about three quarters ago, and that's progressively building a data set. But to be blunt, it's a starting point only. It provides the information by electorate, and it's Commonwealth electorate, and by local government area of how many people are on each welfare payment but it is a starting point. And so what we can do then is say, okay, that's up there, that's the open data, and we'll try and expand that progressively over time, I'm sure. We can look at sharing data that's de-identified. We don't get into the privacy fight. We don't start the, well, how can you get into that data? What's it going to say about individuals? What I would say is before you get to integrating data and looking at linked data sets, look at what data is around that's de-identified. Don't have the fight that could take you a year to work your way through it. That's whether you're using state data alone, Commonwealth data, whatever. But take your time, understand what's in there, work out what your true focus might be, then if need be, have the debate around privacy. But I think the mistake a lot made is give us a big data set, can we link it with something else? That takes you X years time. Then you get it and look at it and say, I have no idea what's in this. Because actually it is an amazing skill to be able to look into data sets and work out what is in there. So ask for help. And I do need or I'll get scalped by some of the team. There is a cost recovery element. Our core business with data is accurate, timely payments to the citizens of Australia on the welfare side. It's not, we're not a research organisation. So where we can, we try and get open data, put it up on the website. But if we can assist in a cost recovery position of working with agencies, with other organisations, the value of the data is huge and we'd like to try and help. So last message is um, think about the people. Curiosity. I did briefly have a cat there, but we know what happened to the cat when they're curious, so the meerkat's a better, uh, a better example. But you have to be curious. You've got to wonder. You've got to look at what if. You can't just assume that data is going to get there and say, here is the answer, that's what I've been looking for. If you are, you're probably trying to channel the answer and get the answer you want rather than what the data will tell you. And we've all been in positions where we've been asked to uh, have you got some evidence to support X, Y, or Z? Now, we all need to do that, but at the same time, true research and true going through and try and work out what the future direction is, is to be curious about the data, go and find something, have a starting proposition, a bit of a target, but then work through and don't narrow it down too much because then you're asking what you think is the right question about what you think is the right data and you could be totally bloody wrong and waste a lot of time. So I'll end with there, but Go back to the oil rig. It's valuable, it's a resource, you should be using it. And if you aren't, work out how to do it. And at the other end of it, be curious, think about the people. It's the skill set of the people that make data happen. It's not just a data set you pick up and look at and think, great, I now know the answer. I think that's my time. Thanks very much. <laughs>